Hallo Bea! Shout out to Lee Satterfield. Walker Wine session number 10. I made it all that way. <laughs> Double digits. Uh, good to be back on this cold, wet, rainy week here um, in mid, mid, late May. Um, it's been a cold April and May here where I am in the southeast, uh, mid-Atlantic, mid-Atlantic. And um, yeah, that's just a crazy, crazy year for Mother Nature thus far and other things that are going on in life and the global situation. And thankfully we've got some wine in bottle. <laughs> some last months, years, and or decades. Mm. Beautiful color. Hopefully that focuses in well. I've got a wine for you today from the Alto Adige, aka the Sud Tyrol, or South Tyrol. Um, it's in the north central area of Italy, um, just bordering Austria. There's a little sliver of Austria that kind of sneaks in between Germany and Italy. Um, the town, the skiing town of Innsbruck is there. And so um, the Alto Adige is this just stunning valley um, that mostly runs north to south uh, with oodles of other valleys coming off at different angles. It's tucked into the Dolomite Mountains and opens up into the, the plains of the Veneto and such to the south, um, but just dominated by the Dolomite Granite Mountains there. Stunning, beautiful place. I highly recommend you go. Um, drink the wine, eat the food, meet the people. Um, just one of my favorite places that I've been to on planet Earth. But one more time, this is Turnhof. This is the producer, 2018. This is their La Grine. Merla was what they're calling it. Um, and uh, I am a huge fan of La Grine. Uh, I haven't had too many recently. Um, they, they're somewhat difficult to find. Uh, I'm a huge fan of some of the reservers that are made and, and, and good vintages as well. And as uh, things, generally speaking, tend to warm up, they're having warmer and warmer years in the Alto Adige of Italy and are making riper and riper and more delicious, delicious red wines. Um, I have not had any wines from this producer before and but I'm, I've been to the area, uh, the main town in the north is called Bolzano or Bozen in German. Um, and it's a very interesting cultural area as it um, used to be German years ago before the wars. And then uh, since then, um, it's Italian. And so you have this really interesting fusion of Italian and German um, culture and lifestyle. And... Um, it hits a beautiful balance for me. I don't live there. I'd love to live there. Um, but just the food and the, and the people and the terrain and scenery is undeniably stunning. Um, and, the, and the wines across the board, red and whites and rosé and sweet, um, they hit just this tremendous value and character and sometimes simplicity in the best of ways. Um, so I can't highly recommend it enough. This wine from Turnhof uh, is their entry level and they seem to make two different Lagrines. This is their, their mainstay wine. It's a small producer located in the city of Bolzano where you have the confluence of two major rivers, these alpine rivers that are raging in spring and crash together and go south and become the Adige River. Um, and in town there, you've got some wineries situated. Uh, one of my favorites is Murray Gris, which is, uh, is a monastery. And uh, the monks certainly know how to ferment and distill their beverages and spirits. 
So this one is located just to the south of, or within the city of Bolzano, and um, Andreas Berger, the producer, uh, works with three different vineyard sites that he gets fruit from. This one comes from the most southern site, um, just south of the town, lower elevation, and the alluvial floodplains. Um, and so you have that those more uh, sandy, alluvial, lighter soils. Um, where this wine comes from, which usually tends to be towards, lends toward a more aromatic style of wine, especially in reds. It makes them a little bit uh, more expressive in that aroma realm, I would say. So they were purporting this and, and wanting this to be their kind of fruity, fresh, drink, young, enjoy it with a slew of meats and cheeses and such type of wine. Um, so let's dive on in. I just poured the, the, the wine for the first time. Um, so I haven't written down any notes other than just a little bit of research I've done on the, on the winery, but uh, really excited about this. Definitely just, it smells like fresh wine. Um, this kind of, not Welch's, but blackberry, a little, not the spiciness of Concord, but a little bit of that grape jelly aspect. Um, big, big fruit, um, and kind of what I was expecting. I, I assume this is gonna be a softer style of, of wine. It aged for only two or three months and larger oak uh, botti, um, so which are anywhere between three and, you know, 20 or 30 times the size of a normal barrel um, and are quite popular in, in old regions of the world and specifically to Italy has a lot of them. These larger format oak vessels to age in. So you're not going to get any new oak flavors from these barrels unless they were just recently purchased which um, I don't know how much, I know it's becoming a little bit trendier here in the States. I'm not sure how much reinvesting is going on over there. I think you see, uh, tend to see a little bit more of a trend from these bigger Bonti, large old vessels to newer, smaller barriques, French oak barrel predominantly, um, to make these bigger, riper um, wines that age faster in those small barrels. The big barrels that age much more slowly have less oxygen to uh, wine ratio contact. Um, and so the wines age more slowly in those big, 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 usually Slovenian oak casks. There's a great pencil lead shaving to this. There's a coolness and a freshness, I'd say. It's almost like you're just standing by, you know, under a waterfall or by a river. And there's just so much of that, um, you know, if there's ozone in the air, but just that, that beautiful freshness that you get from moving, specifically moving water. Um, that kind of just kind of brings you in a little bit. Um, definitely some peppercorn, maybe some black and green peppercorn. Mm, you know, I just, I just love the wines from this area. The whites are beautiful. They've got um, local varieties, indigenous varieties. Le Grine is one of those varieties that is, a, is an offspring of two different varieties from the Alto Arage, uh, Schiava and Teraldigo. Um, and for the most part, for me, I haven't had too many Schiavas, but it's, it's usually made, used for rosé and such. The quality of, of wine that comes from Schiava isn't particularly high. Um, Teraldigo, a different case, but I think Le Grine for me has the best uh, marriage of the two, and, and, and that's why I think 8 or 9% of the Alto Adige is planted to Le Grine, so it's still one of those indigenous varieties that's holding on, um, kind of faded away and has come back, and uh, I'm, happy, I'm happy for that, um, that it is doing so. Um, but they make us, they grow a slew of grapes now, international and indigenous, in the Sud du Alto Adige region, and, um, you know, from Cabernet Sauvignon and Merlot and Sauvignon Blanc, traditional Bordeaux varieties predominantly, but also you'll see Pinot Noir in there. Um, you know, and then you've got you know, Riesling, Muller Thurgau, um, 
Pinot Gris, Pinot Blanc, Sylvaner. Um, so you have these kind of German whites. Uh, and then you also have, you know, some of their offspring you have and in indigenous varieties, Noziola, Kerner, um, Kerner, fantastic, and Noziola, fantastic white varieties. Uh, Moscato Giallo, one of my favorite whites that we, I tasted back on wine review, I'm not sure, but it had a single digit, probably four or five. Um, yeah, so just this is such a beautiful wines um, that have this great minerality. There's so much terroir in the region because of this just major change in elevation, recent volcanic history, uplifting. So you have oceanic sedimentary soils, you have clay, you have alluvial, um, you know, just a diverse, broad range of elevations, uh, winemaking styles, grape varieties. Um, and uh, you know it's 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 a place that, as you can tell under my review, fully captures my heart and my senses, um, as I love to sniff and smell things and taste things and ponder the greater meaning of life and wine. It's definitely a pretty violet aspect. Um, that kind of delicate, floral, cool spring day uh, touch to this wine amongst that kind of very poppy um, black and blue fruit component. But just gorgeous color. Um, hopefully you can see that, but just this purpley, purpley blue black, um, you know, vibrant, vibrant color. There's a little bit of this like uh, blackberry cassis. Um, that's fantastic. There's a great distillery in Oregon uh, called Clear Creek uh, that's given me an opportunity to taste um, some fantastic eau de vies and, uh, and liqueurs, fruit liqueurs um, in their purest of forms. And so it's, it's been a great, that's been other than enjoyment, it's been a great education and what those products taste like in you know, a liqueur because they're hard to come by and, and so many things are artificially flavored these days that you don't always get the, the real McCoy um, when it comes to comes to flavors um, that you get in the grocery store and, and, uh, and whipped cream vodka and the finer things in life. Maybe a little bit of this tarry component. Um, so that's nice. I, I like that there's something else going on than just the fruit. I didn't expect the wine to be extremely complex. Um, it's not blowing me away in its complexity, but it seems to have some, some layers, especially too, just within five or 10 minutes in the glass. This is my first sip of wine for the day, so. Uh, I'm not going to particularly judge it too harshly on that first uh, lick of the Tootsie Roll Pop. Mm. Good texture, lively, juicy acidity. Uh, there's a little bit of tannin there, which is very nice. It keeps it balanced. My first sip, I'm getting that kind of little touch of sulfur, but I think those things will kind of die, die, off, die down and my palate will acclimate to, um, to this wine a little bit. Mm. First sip, lovely. Um, just to talk a little bit about turnoff and maybe the, the region is too. So turnoff, small producer, uh, sixth generation winemaker, and um, this one, which is kind of an entry level line brand, but 4,000 bottles produced, so not, not a whole lot in the, in the grand scheme of things. Um, quite small production, you know, five, four or 500 cases, uh, 400 cases maybe, or not even that. Um, but yeah, the Alto Autoge, it's uh, just going out and looking at it. Um, they could, I think, do a little bit better job with their, um, 
their the, the tourist information and the wineries and such. There's a, there's a page that has all the wineries to visit, but not particularly a whole lot about the region and its diversity. Um, I like to see that, but they've got a lot of the wineries now are carrying this specific foil that on the top, I don't have it, it's in the other room right now, but it's got a little background of the mountains, which they're so well known for. Um, there's a beautiful scenic drive. It's one of, apparently one of the best, most beautiful um, automobile drives or motorcycle drives in the world um, that goes uh, through the Dolomite Mountains there and through this area. Um, but from, you know, cross country and skiing and, um, you know, winter sports, summer sports, uh, fishing, uh, hunting, you, you name it, they've got it there. Um, so yeah, they've, this, this area to me is kind of a, an up and coming region. Um, I think people are noticing it in Europe and in Italy and in Germany and the prices have gone up since I originally visited there in 2010. Um, I think there's still a lot to discover uh, and to, to for the area to grow, of course. Um, but hopefully we'll see more and more of these wines in the States and hopefully not too expensive. Um, that would be the goal because when I first went over there, the wines were quite reasonable, um, especially in Europe and were just out of this world values. Um, some of the bigger, per, bigger classic, very good producers are, um, their prices are starting to reflect the quality, um, you know, and, and, and so it's, they're less of a day-to-day -day value uh, type of wine, but. Uh, such a, just an intoxicating nose, you know, um, you know, dark, dark, you know, roses. Um, it really just pulls you in, uh, in my opinion. Like it, it is just, I just think of like this, a beautiful, a beautiful woman, um, you know, dressed in this like, you know, dark, dark plum velvet um, dress. Elegant, touch sweet, a touch floral, a touch spicy. Uh, what more could you ask for? Palette's still a little tight. It's starting to open up. I'm getting this kind of fun, um, you know, little touch of, of mocha or something along those lines. So, you know, maybe there were some oak adjuvants added at some point. Um, but yeah, beautiful kind of, just, just kind of ethereal um, tantalizing tannins, nothing too big or grippy, but enough to keep things interesting and versatile enough with food. Um, there's some acidity there, but it's not overwhelming by any means. Uh, I believe they're at five grams per liter um, total acidity. That's what they stated on the website. They said about. <laughs> Yeah, I like the I like the contrast between the spicy, this fresh fruit, the floral, and this this component that's a little dark and brooding in there. This tar mocha, there's a richness in there. Uh, I think that keeps it keeps it in check, keeps it and gives it just a little bit more character to it. Um, that's going to engage more types of people, which I'm always about, you know, almost, I don't know about soy sauce, but like a plum sauce, maybe, you know, something along those lines. If you're a cook, if you're a cook, um, mm. Mm. some red fruits, 
some black raspberry, some raspberry, some um, kind of blood orange aspect to the acid. Mm. You know, it's a great, it's a great quaffer of a wine. It's a great little pop and pour. Um, I would recommend this to really any type of red wine drinker. Uh, you know, if all you drank were overly tannic, um, you know, reds or, um, you know, high acid, austere Pinot Noir, maybe I wouldn't recommend it to you. But man, this hits a huge segment, a very playful wine, but also engaging. And so I can appreciate that. Um, do I have any final notes? Um, I'd like to put it, possibly come back and maybe do just a little wrap up. Uh, as these wines, you know, we don't give them any justice, giving them a review, tasting them uh, for five or ten minutes. They're going to evolve all the wines, whether they get better, stay the same, change, or get worse. That's all subjective, and um, so I don't want to just throw out, uh, you know, my final my final conclusions on this wine yet. But, um, oh, 13 alcohol by volume as well. Um, but... Yeah, I talked a little bit about the grape varieties. There's some, some great different selections you can get from the Alto Adige. Uh, go out to your local retailer and ask for a Kerner, K-E-R-N-E-R. -E uh, just a stunning white, a, a Riesling-esque, but usually never sweet. Um, great, great white wine um, for, for any, you know, an elegant night, uh, you know, pasta night, uh, cassoulet, what have you. Um, yeah, there's a, there's loads to discover there and, um, I will be back with you shortly. So until then, as the Germans say, Grüß Gott, Auf Wiedersehen. Hey, I'm back. I've opened up the side porch window. It's currently raining and has been raining. <laughs> Today is the third day that it's been raining in a row, all day, all night. Um, I think as previously discussed too, I uh, I wrapped up a video, I don't know, eight or nine, seven, eight or nine, the pre wrapped um, with with tasting it outside, and I mean I can't overemphasize the, you know what mother nature does to wine and being outside in that open fresh air environment um, can do to help a wine blossom um, to really come alive for you so um, try it out in a different vessel possibly if you notice that I've swapped up the glasses on uh, just to see if there is any difference which which there is um, certainly in the nose and so yeah, um, getting some fresh air in here. I, I certainly found some more complexities uh, to the wine. Uh, you know, I will say that I, you know, to an extent, I'm kind of reaching and searching a little bit from time to time, but um, nothing that I, uh, you know, I'm not, that I'm not not perceiving. Uh, but like this, this fun kind of Dr. Pepper aspect, um, definitely a, a creme de cassis, creme de, de blackberry liqueur. Um, you know, lovely kind of aspect is almost like an orange soda kind of thing on the finish that I thought was really lovely. Um, so there's this brightness to the wine. Um, there's a, a depth and a darkness to it. Um, a tarry, um, I kind of get this almost like a little bit of a guanciale smoked, smoked jowl, smoked pork meat. Um, smoked bacon type of aspect to it as well, but um, the fruit reigns supreme. Don't be confused. Um, it takes the cake, but um, I highly recommend it. And I will, I will, I think my final thoughts, um, that's kind of what I write down. And as I go, you know, I'm going to continue to hone in on, you know, how I want to present the information that I present and what information that I do present. And um, you know, I don't want to just go down some technical checklist for you because I don't think that's uh, practical when we're all enjoying wine and drinking wine. Um, <laughs> excuse me. 
But so that said, I mean, maybe at some point I'll, I'll give these wines a final, a final score, a final mark, a final double thumbs up, double thumbs down, whatever it may be. Um, because I would like to give you an aspect of what my uh, final thoughts are in a very uh, direct, easy, you know, way to monitor and track um, and to compare with other products that I review. And it's always hard too because you have the 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 aspect of price point. And this one I forgot to mention was twenty bucks on the dot for me um, here in the states. And um, you know that's where I'd you know like to see it. I, if I had paid more, I'd probably be a little disappointed. If I had paid twenty five or thirty bucks, I'd probably want a little bit more out of this wine. But um, yeah, my final thoughts I think are. That, you know, after consuming it, I've waited a half an hour, an hour, and of course it's going to continue to evolve. Um, I think it really screams for food. Um, you know, I think some creamier cheeses would be lovely. Um, I'm having some, some red cabbage and some form of meatballs, you know, maybe a German or Scandinavian type uh, melange of a dis dish. Uh, sorry, I got a little stuffy, but uh, it needs it needs some food. I don't think particularly any acidic foods. Uh, I would stay away from those with this wine, uh, but I think this wine will shine um, amongst some foods, some kind of creamy and earthy foods. I think this will really uh, pull those foods. Um, into a lighter fare and this will match it with this gorgeous fruit component. Uh, there is this almost like a little herbaceousness there too. I was picking up on um, with that, as mentioned, green peppercorn, maybe a, a spicy uh, oregano aspect. Um, so it's got enough going on to keep you engaged. And uh, I hope you go out and explore the Sud Tirol or Alto Adige, um, however you see it. And um, until next time. Cheers. Ciao.